I want to share with you today about courage. How many could use a little extra courage? Here's a story that I love from uh, Kent Hughes recounts this in his book on Acts, the Church of Fire. Here it is. When Lou Little was football coach at Georgetown University, he had on a squad a player of average ability who really got into the game. The coach Little was fond of him. He especially liked the way he walked arm in arm with his father on campus. One day shortly before a big game with Fordham, the boy's mother called with the news that his father had died that morning of a heart attack. The student went home with a heavy heart but was back three days later. Coach, he pleaded, will, will you start me in the game against Fordham? I think that is what my father would have liked most. After a moment's hesitation, Little said, okay, but only for a play or two. True to his word, he put the boy in, but he never took him out. For 60 action-packed minutes, that inspired young man ran and blocked like an All-American. After the game, the coach praised him, son, you have never played like that before. What got into you? Remember how my dad and I used to go arm in arm, answered the boy? Well, he was totally blind. And today was the first day he ever saw me play. I just love that because I think all of us can relate to that in a certain way. If I took a show of hands, how many of you have been encouraged by the memory of a loved one that you knew was on your side and prayed for you and loved you? And so you've got a doctor's appointment, you've got a big challenge ahead, and in the back of your mind you're thinking, my mom, my dad, whoever it is, they're there in heaven. They can see they're rooting for me. The Apostle Paul had such a relationship with Jesus Christ. He had met him on the road to Damascus, but other than that and Jesus showing up a few times in his life, Paul demonstrates courage like no other. And what's amazing to me as we start in this part of chapter 21, and it goes all the way to chapter 26. Now, I'm going to preach through the whole thing today. We'll be done by 6 p.m., I'm sure. <laughs> now, I'll take a few weeks to get through it. The essence is that Paul is under great persecution. Criticism. How many have ever been criticized? I got a few over here who aren't raising your hands. How many have really been criticized? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's very hard <clears throat> to be courageous, not only when you're cr criticized, but when you're falsely criticized. You're held responsible for something you didn't even do. I find it amazing as we go through these texts, and this morning I'm just going to read down through the text and make some comments on it, but... As we read about Paul and how he dealt with these circumstances in his life, he's as cool as a cucumber. He never gets overly excited. You know, he was chased around by the gal who was filled with a demon for over a week and never said anything, and finally he turned around and he rebuked her. Paul had great patience, but patience and courage work together. Or they're very similar anyway. Remember, James said that it's under trial that patience is produced. That's why most of us never pray for patience, right? Because if you pray for patience, the only way it's produced is if you go through a trial. 
Same thing, I think, with courage, though there's no direct verse like there is for patience. Courage is the same way. You don't need courage till you need it. And then when you need it, boy, do you ever need it. But courage will rise up in the face of trial and circumstance. There are three areas that Paul shows courage. I have it on your handout over on the left above letter A there. Paul finally gets to Jerusalem. Number one, courage to return to Jerusalem. Number two, courage when accused and misunderstood. Number three, courage to trust in God. I want to personalize each one of those three in preparation for reading the text. Courage to return to Jerusalem. How many of us would identify it took courage to go somewhere? To courage to go to your parents, courage to go to your kids, courage to go to the IRS meeting. <laughs> You fill in the blank. Courage to go somewhere. And especially with Paul. Remember, for the last couple of weeks in the book of Acts, all through Paul's journey, they're telling him, don't go to Jerusalem, man. You're, they're going to bind you up. They're going to throw you in jail, yada, yada, yada. And Agabus, in the, last, in the first part of the chapter, he ties himself up and says, this is going to happen to you. And all that did happen. But courage is also connected to call. What has God called you to do and be? If, he's God, if God had called you to be a doctor, you have to have the courage to go through medical school and go through all that it takes. God called you to be an engineer. God called you to be a bus driver, whatever it is. It takes courage to answer the call, take the training, get the experience to fulfill what God has called you to do. Now, I love being called to be a grandparent. That's easy. Well, sort of. There are certain things in life that we're called to that doesn't require as much courage, but the courage that I need to answer the call of Christ, let's say for witnessing. I'm standing out front of the grocery store about ready to go in buy my grocery. There's a person out in the front. They're standing there. You know they're going to ask for food or money. Do you have the courage to share the gospel? Do you have the courage to pray for them? Do you have the courage to meet a need? A lot of times we walk by opportunities that require a certain level of courage to walk into those opportunities. It's just not a time factor is a courage factor. I don't want to be seen as a weirdo. I don't want to be turned down. As you know, I've prayed for hundreds and hundreds of people, strangers. I've only been turned down twice when I asked them, can I pray for you? Everybody needs prayer. So this lesson in courage of going somewhere, you will go somewhere today or this week, will where courage is going to be needed in your heart. And we see this in Paul's life. Number two, courage when misunderstood. Now, the lesson we'll see today is rather staggering. Paul never answers his accusers. I don't know about you, but when people are accusing me, I mean, I'm making the list of all my excuses and all my reasons. You, you misunderstood me. You don't know the context. Boy, you're, you're getting on the defense. Paul never goes on the defense. And worse, some of his accusers are his own brethren. In chapters, in, from chapter 21 to 26, there's 27 different personalities that are involved in Paul's life. But because he had the courage to go to Jerusalem, the courage to take the criticism, the third thing is he had the courage to trust in God. If there's anything else in the message today, I need the courage to trust. I have a tendency to want to trust in my 
uh, reasoning power, my personality, my good looks. How many have good looks? I mean, uh, well, I, I, you, 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 come on, everybody should have your hands. You look in the mirror and the man, I look good today. Do that tomorrow, okay? Yeah, yeah you guys are great. Acts chapter 21, 17 to 40. The entire text isn't on here. I couldn't get it all on here. I'll go to the Bible to read the last part. Let me just walk through this. Uh, the outline on the left kind of fits with it, but I won't refer to it too often. Verse 17, and when he had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received him gladly. I love it. So all along he's been warned about getting there. He gets there and everybody, hey, welcome, way to go. Verse 18, on the following day, Paul went in, went with us to see James. James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And all the elders were present, verse 19. When he had greeted them, he had told in detail the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Chapter 20, verse uh, A. That's the first half of verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified God. Wow, way to go. God is really working. I split the verse for obvious reasons. Follow along, 20b, the second half of that verse. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed and they are all zealous for the law. But they've been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise <clears throat> their children nor walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So here's the deal. Wow, Paul, you're really doing great. Praise God. However, however, we got this one thing against you. Yeah, the thing that bothers me in this is why wasn't James and the other leaders standing up for Paul? Have you been in that situation? How come a spouse? How come a family member? How come church members or elders? How come your best friends don't stand up to, for you when you're accused and they know it's wrong? Has that ever happened to you? Don't raise your hand. But it's happened to me. The people who I thought for sure would stand up for me, all of a sudden they're totally silent. And that's exactly what happens here. It's tragic. But you don't see Paul going off the deep end. Verse 23. Therefore, do what we tell you. Oh, I love this part. So now the accusers have come to accuse Paul. The leaders in Jerusalem... They say, hey, Paul, you're doing a good job. However, we got this, this thing going on and all these people are complaining about it. Here's, here's what we want you to do. That's verse 23. Therefore, do what we tell you. Doesn't sound like a suggestion, does it? <laughs> we have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and they may know that those things which uh, they were informed concerning you are nothing. But you, are, you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written to them and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from the things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from, se from sexual immorality. So, so you have a group of believing Jews these are Jews who believed in the Lord as their Savior. But they wanted to follow the Old Testament. In a minute, you'll be introduced to another set of Jews. Those are the unbelieving Jews who had heard these rumors. So you've got the believing Jews. You've got the uh, non-believing Jews. You've got the leaders of the church. They're all pretty much against Paul. And they're thinking that by fulfilling the seminar seminar this uh, 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 fulfilling the law which he'd already done a Nazarite vow he had done that already before so he says okay I'll go through the vow the vow wasn't 
had nothing to do with salvation, but it had to do with the fact that he loved the law and Paul, to that extent, observed the law. Verse 26, then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered into the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering would be made for them. Verse 27, now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, now these were the Jews that were not born again. These were the guys in the, at Ephesus. Remember the big riot at Ephesus? And Paul was, was, was thrown out of the city. Uh, they were going to stone him. It was a bad scene. He had been there for two years. A lot of people have been saved. But the non-believing Jews rose up in Ephesus. And that's who these are in verse 27, the Jews from Asia. Seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd to lay hands on him, crying, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, in this place. And furthermore, he also uh, brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Look at verse 29. For they had previously seen Trophimus, who had come with Paul from Ephesus, with him in the city, who they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. More problems more accusations, more difficulties in life come about because people suppose or assume. So they were assuming because they saw this guy with him for sure that he took him into the temple. And so they're raising a huge fuss over it. Verse 30, and all the city was disturbed. I got to tell you, rumors, assumptions, can spread so fast and have no basis in truth. Well, the natural thing is you want to defend yourself in that situation, right? And go like that. Yes, right. I want to defend myself. Nobody likes to be falsely accused. That's not what Paul does. Verse 30, And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and immediately closed the doors. Now, as they were seeking to kill him. Oh, my word. They were going to do him in. News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took the soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So Rome was in charge of the uh, orderly process in the city. They heard that there was a riot going on, so they run down there to see what's going on. Verse 33. Then the commander came and took him and uh, commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what, had, what he had done. And some of the people, some of the multitude cried one thing and some another. I love this. Some are saying this, some are saying that, some are saying nobody knew what was going on. Paul was in the midst of people throwing accusations. Nobody knew anything. And there's Paul in the middle, getting beat to death. Going on verse 34. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence. I mean, this is getting to be so bad. So crazy that the soldiers, the Romans, had to save Paul. Sometimes our salvation comes from the most unlikely source. Let me say that again. Sometimes our salvation or deliverance comes from the most unlikely source. Several times in my life, a decision was on the line. And somewhere out of nowhere, a person steps forward and I'm rescued because of what they say. Thank God that God intervenes that way in our life. Here are these Romans. 
save Paul from being carried away by the mob. And verse 36, for the multitude of the people followed after crying, away with him. That was the very same thing they cried about Jesus. Let me go to my Bible now to read the rest of this, 37 through 40. And then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who, can't, who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 assassins? In, oh, here we go again. Nobody's got it right. The crowd doesn't have it right. The Ephesian uh, elders didn't have it right. The Jerusalem elders didn't have it right. Now the guard, he thinks Paul's led a, a rebellion a few years ago. Everybody's got an opinion about Paul, none of which is correct. Have you ever had that? Everybody's got an opinion about you, but none of them is really correct. Don't raise your hand. Okay. I know that touches a few of you, okay? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So he gave him permission. Now Paul's being dragged up the, uh, the stairs. Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And then there was a great silence because he started to speak in Aramaic or in Hebrew, the language that they understood. So we'll pick up this next week. I wonder how many that are here this morning are going to need courage today or this week for something. I wonder how many here have been accused by family members or friends or whoever falsely and wrongly and you want to pull your hair out, yell and scream. You'll notice that Paul doesn't do any of that. What he does do, he has the courage to trust God through it, to give it to God, that God is somehow going to work this out. I know that this week I'll need courage for things I don't need, know I'll need courage for. <laughs> Can I say that again? I'm going to need courage for things I don't, need, don't know I'm going to need courage for. Because what happens is circumstances come up where I need courage that I didn't know I needed before. So, courage is prompted by the circumstances in our life. It's that point that when courage is needed, I need to trust God to fill me because I can't do it with my own personality. I need God to fill me with that courage for that moment. I need to be like Paul, learn not to react, but to act. Learn not to react, but to act. Reaction is out of my emotion. Acting is drawing on the resources that God has given me. How many of you know you have all the resources you need for this life? Somebody say amen. You have all the resources you need. And this week, when you need them, they will be there. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray right now, I know there are some in this room that are going to need the courage to face a circumstance. Some of you right now know what that circumstance is because it's vivid in your heart and your mind. Open your heart right now and say, Lord, I receive the strength of your courage. Fill me with your courage because I know that you will see me through. You are God of the outcome and you will deliver me. Even as you delivered Paul through all of this, 
you will deliver me. Thank you, Lord. I, I pray over this congregation and those in the sound of my voice. You give them the courage for the moment, for the day, for the week, for the year. Wherever they're going, whatever people say, give them the courage to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand together. Sing together, bless the Lord God Almighty. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in the Lord. 